All right. So um, we wanted to walk through the issues that we've got put together for um, what we're doing for the on-demand scans, as well as the uh, site profiles, the scanner profiles, and the profile library uh, to kind of create a, a full vision of what we're doing around each of these. Since there's been some confusion and also uh, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So I'm going to walk through what we have and how it's laid out. Uh, and if there are any questions, just go ahead and bring them up. Uh, no reason to wait until the end. Um, the, uh, the one thing that I do want to say is that there are a couple of ways that, that uh, we've gone through this and I haven't been able to kind of um, uh, get everything into the same format. So there are a few issues that are in epics with front end and back end uh, issues assigned to them. And then there's other issues that I created as uh, sort of iteration is issues so that you can see kind of the, the final vision in the epic. And then you can see what I, uh, what I would be okay delivering in multiple iterations. And by saying that they are, you know, iteration one, iteration two, iteration three, I'm not necessarily saying that these have to be delivered in separate milestones. So I kind of want to go through a, a more of like a Kanban type of style of, of uh, delivering these and saying that, you know, this is, uh, for example, with the site profile, this is what I'm okay delivering to a customer as a as an MVC, if you know whoever's working on this gets done with this and realizes that they've got time to pull in this second part uh, of uh, like the next iteration into the same milestone, I don't have a problem with that. Um, so uh, right now, I don't have specific milestones assigned to anything other than the first iteration. Uh, because we've decided, you know, some of these we're going to deliver in 13.2 and then like uh, the scanner profile uh, we're going to deliver in 13.3. So the first iteration has a milestone assigned to it. The rest of them that is up for debate and I didn't want to arbitrarily say, you know, no iteration three has to be assigned to 13.4 even though you all think that you can get it into 13.3. Uh, so there's some flexibility there in terms of pulling things into milestones. Yeah, and I would add uh, specifically, like I don't think on designs we've got four iterations uh, for the site profile. We definitely probably don't want that stretched out over four it four milestones. Um, it's very likely that you know maybe the first two or three can be done in a single milestone. Yeah. So uh, that's that. I don't want to. Yeah. Uh, like Seth said. Um, I don't, I don't want to arbitrarily assign a due date from product management if you think that you can get it done more quickly. Uh, so, yeah, I think the exercise here has been, these are uh, the smallest, what Derek and I have looked at is the smallest pieces of atomic work that we could deliver. Um, right. But if we can, if we can do two or three of them at a, a time, let's do that. Um, but these were the smallest pieces that we, we could think of uh, realistically. Are these independent, each section? So site profile iteration one could be done and released independently of scanner profile iteration one? Yes. Okay. Yeah, cool. so I started to go through, there are a couple of things that are dependent on another iteration, like using the site profile in the on-demand scan that's kind of dependent on actually getting a site profile. Uh, so there are some interdependencies in terms of the the tasks here, because really what a lot of these things are, are more of tasks than they are actual issues, but we don't have tasks in GitLab. So they're all issues. Um, so there are some interdependencies, but in general, yeah, like the reason, the only reason that this is even in iteration one right now is because uh, you know, we push the initial delivery of the on-demand scan uh, milestone. And now 
uh, you know, it's being developed alongside of the, the site profile. So theoretically, we could get this with just the form being in the scan page rather than being able to select a profile. So theoretically, the initial delivery is independent of getting a, uh, a site profile done. Um, so right. the, the other piece that I just want to highlight is um, if you look at the top, we've got these as issues. And then if you scroll down under uh, site profile iteration, those are epics. So right. We've been playing around with whether these should be issues or whether they should be epics and then we should have sub issues. Uh, there's not necessarily a consensus just yet. So uh, bear with us. And certainly I think uh, the, the question is coming out of this, um, what the best way to organize this work is. I certainly right. have, have my opinion on that, uh, but I wanna, um, as we go through this and as people start working on this, get everyone's thoughts is the best way to organize this. Yep. And that was a question that I, I was going to have for all of you once we go through these, what makes the most sense to you and how it's best laid out. And so I was starting to, to change these into to issues or, you know, to, to get them uh, into the same uh, paradigm as the rest of these. But then I thought it actually might be good to go through the two different ways of looking at them and get uh, input from you know, the people that will actually be working on it uh, to see what makes the most sense uh, so we can organize them in whatever way makes sense. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the on-demand area. And these are broken down. To me, the on-demand area is independent of the profiles and the configuration. Uh, we could have thought or we could have decided to use the profiles in the CICD pipelines first and just have that form in the, uh, the on-demand area. So to me, they are totally separate. I, I don't want anybody to think that the profiles will only ever be used in the on-demand scans. Uh, they will be used in the pipeline as well eventually once we uh, get to that point and figure that out. So that's why they are broken up in these, these two different areas and why they have different epics um, for each of them. So starting with the on-demand scans, the initial delivery, uh, we're reusing this parent epic that had already been created. And this is, is basically what you've all seen. Um, I don't think there's anything new in this the design does need to be updated if we're going to be using the site profile to show the selection of the site profile. Um, but this was the initial delivery that we had thought of. So I don't think we really need to go through this unless so, Seth, you want to. Uh, no, I'm just wondering if everyone's comfortable with uh, what on-demand scans looks like, what the site profile is, what the scanner profile is, if we should back up and look at those designs as a whole or whether everyone's comfortable jumping into these issues. Any, any preference or? I mean, I've seen it, but I can't speak for everyone. Yeah, I'm comfortable as well, but yeah. Okay, because I, I don't want to jump into these issues because these issues are like, you miss the forest when you're in these issues and that, that's one of the challenges. Um, are we so, confident that everyone watching this video will, will know? Does it hurt to quickly run through? Yeah, do, uh, Derek, do you want to pull up the Figma and yep. uh, if we can walk through kind of what the end state is going to look like? Yep, that works for me. Okay, so starting with the on-demand scans, let's see if this has been hooked up to click through. All right. Um, so this is gonna be the end state. And then I think that the iterations will make sense looking at what we're delivering in each area. Uh, so you would go to on-demand scans in the security and compliance navigation, click on new on-demand scan, 
for the first uh, iteration, I think that actually, uh, yeah, she created one specifically for the MVC. So this one actually is for the MVC. So it shows you what the scan settings are. Uh, this is before we have the scanner profile, so you can't change these, but you can create a new site profile. So if you don't have any profiles created, uh, you can click here, create the name, add in the, uh, the target site. And then again, this is this particular area for the creating the profiles is kind of a final version because the first version doesn't have the uh, authentication in it, um, but you can go through and create all the different uh, options that you need. Create the profile. When you create it, it'll flip you back over to this page. You can select the profile and then see what settings have been set in that profile. Uh, there's still some cleanup to do here. For example, like the password won't be in clear text. Um, and then there's some uh, wording uh, things that need to change. But in general, this is what you've got when you create a profile and, and select it to use in the on-demand scan. You hit run, uh, you see, so this is again, kind of a final version. You'll see the list of on-demand scans. I think in the initial uh, release, we're going to flip you over to the pipeline page and show you uh, the pipelines that are running. Um, but in, but eventually you'll be able to see just the on-demand scans that are running. Um, okay, so now this goes over to the profile library um, where you can see this eventually, if you have multiple profiles, then this will list multiple profiles here. You'll be able to delete or edit them. Um, and I think I'm at the end of the click through. Um, but this also shows you where we're gonna get to eventually with being able to validate the sites. So let me switch back over to uh, uh, okay. I think yeah, maybe, the, be maybe the complete to... flow uh, for new scan with two profiles. Uh, and, might be yeah, it. try hitting play on this. This might be. Uh, Okay. Yeah, this is the, this is the final version. Um, create a new profile. So this is the scanner profile. Select what type of scan it is. Then you get all the different options. Save the profile, select the profile. Same thing. One of the things that you'll see in here is this uh, word save draft. We're getting rid of that. Um, right because you're just going to save that information. There's no, there's no such thing as a draft. You can save a, a site profile and have the website um, not validated. And then we just won't run a scan if the website's not validated and you're trying to run an active scan. So at, at runtime, we'll calculate whether that's validated, uh, but we don't yep. need a, a draft uh, or any state like that. As long as you have a profile name and a URL, those two required fields will, will let the user save it. Yep. All right, and so this is showing you how to validate the site. You choose what type of validation you want, either adding a text file or a meta tag. Um, put in the uh, URL to validate. Hit validate. Uh, this is going away uh, so that you don't save it as a draft. All right, finally, we're at the point to where we can save the profile and you can use it in the scan, run scan. All right, so after you hit run scan, you can click on the pipeline. And no, 
Energetic. So right. here, here's an example of the site wasn't validated. So it's just going to give you an error and prevent you from right. running. So in this case, they're trying to run an active scan uh, against a site that hasn't been validated. Uh, right now, my idea, and, and I know that uh, we've had some discussion on this, um, my thinking is that running a passive unauthenticated scan against an in, uh, a not validated site uh, should be allowable. Running either an authenticated scan, whether it's passive or active, or any type of active scan is not allowable against a non-validated site. Uh, so you'd be able to switch over to validated, hit run. And I think that we're at the end. I thought that it went through so and showed. The only thing that we haven't seen here is, uh, and maybe the managed profiles, is uh, yep. the library page. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which actually the, the button might click there, uh, but this should be pretty straightforward. Um, it's just a page that lists all the sites and then a page that will list all the scanner profiles. Uh, this looks like it might be it. Yep. All right. So this is, uh, and this is something that I commented on the cleanup. Uh, so this actually should be on under security and compliance configuration. And this is actually not the first page that you would see. Um, so. And the idea is once we have the site profile or the scan profile, at some point in your CI YAML file, instead of putting in all those environment variables, you could just say, use this site profile or use this scan profile. So you'd have basically two environment variables that would go into your YAML file. Uh, the site site profile and the scanner profile. And then our scanner would actually get all this data from the database uh, and then bring that in as opposed to having to set all that in your YAML file. Yep. So yeah, when you click on security and compliance configuration, you'll see we'll break out under DAST. We'll, for now, we'll have on demand and you can manage the profiles uh, and then this wording is going to change, but it'll basically be the uh, CACD pipeline and uh, you'll be able to just see what you can right now and see the documentation of how to enable it. Uh, once you do click on the manage button here, or if you're on the on-demand scans page and you click manage profile, so there's two ways to get there, uh, you'll see a list of the site profiles and a list of the scan profiles. You can switch between the two of them. Uh, all right, new profile. And that looks like all that was. But the, the new site profile and the new scan Oops, profile, I think we, we went through those pages. Yep. Uh, the only thing I would say that hasn't been mocked up uh, is editing a profile, but I think it's, it's pretty, I mean, uh, I think all of you can uh, yeah. just so, visualize what that would be when you would edit it. So the edit should take you directly to the, uh, the it's the same as the new page, just pre-populated. Right. Exactly. Uh, because there's no concept of a draft. There's really no state. It's just the, the, the data is pre-filled in. Yep. Um, one thing I haven't seen in any of these is a vulnerability. How, how do we see them? So, uh, yes, that's, if you click on the view details, which this is not linked up, that should take them. Uh, I believe we're just right now going to link them over to the, um, the pipeline page with that, right. uh, with the security tab pre high, pre selected. Yeah. Okay. Um, because it's running on master, they'll also display on the security dashboard, right? Yep. That's correct. Yes. And you know that, when a new pipeline is triggered on master for any particular reason, maybe they're just building and testing like they normally are, which let's assume it doesn't run dust in their pipeline. 
all the vulnerabilities that were found in the on-demand scan will come up on the security dashboard and say this vulnerability is no longer present. If if someone runs a non-DAST uh, pipeline, any, any other pipeline on master, right? It, on scan. Yeah, exactly. Yep. This um, I, I'm saying it's a known issue. I know it's an issue, uh, but it is really important for people to understand, like. If you run, and we have this problem on, uh, I think GitLab, right? If you run the um, the pipeline for documentation, all of a sudden it, it wipes out your vulnerabilities because it looks at the last pipeline, it was documentation, everything's fine, documentation didn't find any scan and it wipes it out. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I don't understand why we've done it that way on the security dashboard, but that is the way it works. Right. Cool. Yeah, and, and that's something I've, I've actually talked to several people about and, and uh, we're hopefully going to come up with something to, to fix that eventually, but that is a known issue. Yeah. And just, just on that point, um, I'd done some work that meant that when we run one of these on demand scans, it doesn't contribute to the last ref status. So say for example, you've got an, a DAS scan and you've run, um, an on demand scan. It doesn't, it doesn't mark that ref sta status as passed. So I don't know if that has any impact on this. What is ref status? So it's like, um, it indicates whether, say if, it, if the ref is master, it indicates whether that there was a successful build on master. So say for example, master was failing, you don't want an on-demand scan to suddenly mark that as passing. So- That makes sense. Interesting, so, it, and there's only one ref, so for master, there's only one ref status, right? So this yeah. won't update that status, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Got it, so the, um, interesting. So that status is, is in a sense manually updated by the pipeline. It's not like they're, it's not saying for ref, go find the pipelines and then find the last status. That's right. Got yeah. it. Is it possible by default to run on the band scans not on master? Because if we do it, if we run on another branch, everything gets siloed, siloed then, and you can just draw Yeah, it. absolutely. I mean, it's essentially hard-coded as to what branch it's running on. Uh, right. we, could, we could hard code it to run on any branch. I, I actually don't know if we need a real branch. I mean, that was one of the other ideas is we could just plug in a fake ref, right? Yeah, for, for now, it does have to run against a branch that exists, but there was some discussion on the merge request with the CI team to say that we might want to kind of create an ephemeral branch. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that doesn't exist. We could create it and then just discard it after that. Okay. Well, that is an interesting idea. Um, the, the original plan uh, past where we were going right now was to allow users to select which branch they want to run it on. Um, but because we can count on there always being a master default branch, um, and there's really no other way that we can uh, default this to any other known branch, that was kind of the reason that we said that it should be on master. It's, it's just easier to deal with as an MVC as a first deliverable. Um, but that is an interesting idea for the ephemeral branches. I, that could be really good. I mean, the, the idea also is that typically if you're running a desk scan, um, like an on-demand desk scan, you're going to be running it against something that's deployed somewhere. Um, since you can't really run it against a, a review app at this point. So it's typically going to be either staging or master. Uh, that the code that it's running against, you can kind of assume that it's one of those those two, and we chose master for now uh, because not everybody has a staging branch. I mean, the only reason branch actually matters if there's any code in the repository that are going to be used for the scan, right? Um, Apart from uh, the whole relationship with master and the security dashboard. Theoretically, but also with DAS, one of, so 
one of the issues with the, that we run into just as a DAS scanner, and, and every DAS scanner has this problem, is correlating where the issues are in your code, right? So if, and that's why I wanted the user to be able to select which branch they are running it against. Because if you're running this against a branch that you may be deployed on whatever you know cloud service you've got, um, but it's a development branch, maybe this vulnerability does not exist in master yet. So if we're running it against master, um, maybe it's already been fixed in a, in, a, in a different branch. That's why eventually I do want them to be able to select which branch it's running on so that they can correlate this vulnerability was found in this version of, of the uh, site or the application uh, so that we know that we, are, we don't have to go looking through all the different branches just to find uh, where that vulnerability resides. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a worthy pursuit. It's just hard because you can't guarantee that the, that the code branch is what is actually deployed on the target being tested. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, I think, practically speaking, the reason we care about a branch right now is just because of how the dashboard and where the results get viewed. Uh, that's, that's really the main reason. Um, I, I'm not sure if people are going to run scans and always pick the right branch in the future. Um, right. Like, I think that's, I think that's more idealistic of like, Hey, I go run this scan and I know the branch is deployed. Let me match up those branches. Uh, ideally that's what they would do, but I don't know if that's what would happen. I think for us, um, having the scan, the URL and the time and date it ran may be enough for customers as they say, Oh, I ran this against this URL on this date. Let me go figure out later where, where that code is. Um, yeah. And it definitely could be. And that's, but that's also where, um, you know, I, I can't force anybody to, to use a product correctly. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, and, and even right now with Dust, it, you can put in a target URL that has nothing to do with your code, right? So it's uh, something that's deployed somewhere completely different. We just assume that they're scanning their own sites. So, uh, you know, we can't really force users to use it correctly. Um, all right. So is everybody, I mean, does that, is that pretty clear with the designs and uh, the different areas? Cool. All right. So um, let's go through the iterations. And like I said, this is just what we think is a good way to break these up so that we can deliver them. Like, deliver a piece of functionality in a milestone. Uh, and if we can deliver more than one, that's great. So the initial iteration right now that's being worked on is just being able to run the scan, seeing the scan in the pipeline page and seeing the results in the pipeline dashboard or the main security dashboard. Uh, and then because we're also working on the First iteration for the site profile, being able to use the site profile in the on-demand scan. The second iteration is being able to use the scan profile, uh, which also I should mention, we are changing the name of this from scan profile to scanner profile uh, for user facing, uh, anything user facing because of the fact that you have your DAS scan and then we're also saying scan profile. Uh, Seth brought up that it could be confusing when you're talking about the two different areas. And so it might be better to use scanner profile. So we're changing the name to scanner profile. I mean, technically, according to this QA glossary, it's an analyzer that produces a scan. But uh, I'm not saying that should affect your language choice. Yeah. So if we use the word analyzer, right, we're really saying analyzer profile. So in this case, I substituted the word scanner for analyzer. But on that, you should be aware that in a lot of the documentation of other secure products, they do say analyzer. So um, good to thoughts. Yeah, okay. I'll leave that to Derek, whether we want to switch scan to analyzer, or sorry, sure. scanner to analyzer. By the way, scanner in the, the glossary at the moment means zap, but yeah. Sure, yeah. 
yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look through that and, and decide uh, whether to change that to analyzer. It, it could be yeah. more clear. I, yeah, and I, I, just the point here is that scan is the instance of a job, basically. Yeah. All right, so second iteration, I want to be able to use the scan, scanner, scan, analyzer profile uh, in the on-demand scan. And this is obviously dependent on the first iteration of the scanner profile. So this is going to have a dependency. Uh, this one, the second part of it is getting that page that it lists um, when you click on on-demand scans, it only lists the, the on-demand scans rather than switching you over to this, the pipeline page to see what's running. It'll uh, just list those scans on that page. And then the final thing is getting uh, usage pins so that we can actually track how many people are using this and how many scans on-demand scans are being run uh, so that we know there's a difference between you know, what people are using for the pipeline scans and what people are using for the on-demand scans. I, I don't think we have usage ping for normal scans, do we? Do you know, sir? We, we do. Um, it's part of the code. It handles all the um, gas scans. Are you I sure? That's that's not, sorry, uh, all of those, um, the scans for secure. Right, yeah. Basically, it's just a bit of code that goes to the database, looks for, um, you know, SAS, you know, DAST, all the report types, and then uh, totals all the number of scans. So it's been changed to not depend on the name of the job. Uh, I believe it's based on report type. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so it will naturally, because we're just creating a, um, a job in the database, it will naturally pick up the on-demand scans as part of a DAST scan. Uh, what we want to do here is to add another usage ping just to pick up the number of uh, on-demand. Right. And there is also some um, confusion around whether we also need another issue for snowplow for the uh, .com usage. Um, there is the telemetry team has been doing some training, I guess, around this. Uh, so I'm, hoping that we'll be, I'll be able to get some clarity from their product managers on what we need to implement uh, to, if there is something separate that we need to implement, because I've heard different things that maybe the usage ping is going away and we're only going to be using Snowplow. So there's, there is some confusion on this right now, um, but I'm hoping that I'll get clarity on that in the next week or so. Yeah. And my high level understanding of it is the usage ping is uh, it's a job basically that will run against your GitLab instance on a periodic basis, I think on by on a monthly basis. So it just every month it goes through your database, looks at what you're using, sends that over to GitLab. Yeah. Um, where my understanding of Snowplow is Snowplow is much more event based. So as these activities occur, it sends that data up to um, up to GitLab's host wherever it's uh, storing that data. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just to say that there's. There may be another issue for this for snowplow. There may not be, um, but there's some uh, some implementation details to work out for this. Yeah, and so snowplow supports both uh, front end and back end event triggering. Uh, I think for this we will probably just do back end for the time being, um, and then we will look at whether there's certain events that we want to track on the front end. But I think uh, front end may just create more noise. All right, and then the last iteration. So, right, the, the design show whenever you select a profile in the on demand page, it shows you the information, the configuration information about that profile uh, underneath it. Uh, I think that that is something that is not necessary in the initial release and getting these uh, profiles and could come later if if it's something that uh, will take more time or I guess uh, 
cause issues with implementing it. Personally, I mean, if, if you know, if you think that it can be pulled in into a uh, previous iteration and we can get it at the same time as using the profile in the uh, on-demand scan, then great, we can pull it in. Um, but I'm just saying, letting you all know that I do not think that this is a necessary uh, piece of functionality to get immediately. All right, so that's all of the on-demand um, issues right now to get us to kind of a, an area that I believe will be very useful for our customers. Um, I just want to point out the way that those are linked is uh, we've got a single issue for all those, or sorry, an issue for each item. Uh, it's not broken up into back end or front end, and it's, there's no epic there. Right. Uh, which I think the next section Derek's going to go through, we have epics set up. Yes, that is correct. Yep. So any questions on that before I move on? All right. Uh, so the second one is the site profile. So this is just creating the profile. So these are all of the different options on that form. So this is the one that's broken down into individual epics. And I haven't created one for the site validation. There's a design epic, but there is no implementation uh, right or a design issue. There is no implementation right now. So that will be added here in the next day or it, so. and the site the site validation is probably the uh, most complicated because uh, absolutely look at yeah one and three you're really talking about a you're talking about a form saving data yeah. uh, the site validation is saving data but we have to then fire off that event generate a file generate a token I, I was going to suggest actually we have a separate conversation about site validation closer to the time yeah sure. I think that's that's fair. Uh, because we talked about this previously, uh, whether it's done just in time, whether it's saved as part of the profile. Um, so I think that that's definitely a good conversation to have. Yep. Um, just uh, on that uh, iteration one, mm -hmm. uh, see how in scanner profile iteration one, it's got target timeout. That probably belongs in the site profile because it's related to the target and how long it takes to start. But it's, a, I mean, that's just an opinion. Do what you want. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of these that are crossovers that are very tricky to figure out whether it belongs in the scanner or whether it's in the site. Um, I think they could go either way. The reason that I put it in the scanner profile is because it is a behavior of the scanner versus a property of the site. And so you could have multiple sites and maybe where a site is deployed makes a difference as to the, the timeout. So I guess that could be a uh, argument for it being in the uh, the site profile, but the, uh, the reason I was putting it in here is because it's a behavior of the uh, the analyzer, the scanner, versus an actual property of the site. Yeah, I just have a feeling that if you have one scanner profile that's like a passive scan and two different sites, I'll have to keep going and editing the scanner profile to change the timeout based on the site they're, they're scanning. But yeah, maybe they and, can just make it the longer time and then they'll be fine. And, and that could be a problem. And we'll see that if people create one site, one scanner profile, another site, another scanner profile. If it's a, if people create a one-to-one -one relationship, then we know we're, we're creating some problem. The idea, if this is done properly, it should be a one-to-many of one website and then like five different scans, right? right? An active scan, a passive scan, one where you exclude all the rules, so on and so forth. Yep. Yeah, so, and that's something eventually I'd like to get much better analytics on how people are using this and be able to track, you know, the number of, not, not any details about like what their U URL is because we don't want to have any privacy issues, but just like, you know, for a project, how many site profiles, how many scanner profiles, um, and then kind of a genericized uh, way of, of figuring out 
what the options are that they're using just so that we can't, so that we don't reveal any uh, private data. Uh, so that's going to take some thinking about how we're going to report on that, which is why th that's not anywhere in this, uh, uh, these issues. Um, and that's also something I'm going to be do doing, actively doing reviews with customers using this uh, so that we get real-time feedback from customers as we go through this. All right, so the site profiles, this has currently been broken up into three different areas. Uh, and then the site validation. The reason this is second in the iteration is because the scanner profile, making it an active or passive scan and the authentication is dependent on having a validated site because we don't want people running this against sites that they don't own and causing issues, uh, vulnerability issues for someone else's site. So this site validation is, is very important to get. So that's, I guess we, we should have this conversation uh, here soon, maybe early next week since uh, tomorrow is a holiday in the US. Um, yeah, go ahead, Ken. I was just going to say, you can still run an authenticated, non-validated scan that's a passive scan, right? Uh, well, this is where we had the discussion before about um, you can still do some damage uh, on a site if you are running a passive scan that's authenticated. Um, I don't know. I go back and forth on it. I, I personally am not sure whether it's worth it to do authenticated passive scans uh, that you can still do damage just on a passive scan though, authenticated or not. It's sure. Just... Right. Uh, to me, uh, and we can discuss this kind of asynchronously. I don't think you should be able to run a passive scan on an authenticated website to give you an example. Like if I plugged in my GitLab credentials to gitlab.com, I authenticate the spider and all of a sudden that spider is going to go click on delete project, delete project, delete project. And I was like, well, I just did what Seth could do. And I didn't really process exactly how much damage it could, could do. So that's why I think if you're plugging in credentials, because once you're authenticated into a website, links, which are, you know, just what the spider is going to follow can be very, very damaging. If you have links that can be damaging to, on an unauthenticated website, then Google and every other spider is probably doing that damage to your website already. Um, but people don't know that damage is possible because you're never authenticating Google into your website. So um, Fair point. I, I think okay. it's, it's just a, people need to be aware, like you plug in credentials, we're going to do what anything we can do. Yep. Uh, so we'll have this uh, conversation uh, next week, but to look at what we have here. And so this is the other way of, building up these um, deliverables, I guess, using epics. Uh, so Neil created these yesterday and it's basically following the iteration uh, workflow that, that I've got here. And the first one, uh, it's uh, so Paul originally created issues for the front end and back end and put in this, this information. So Neil pulled it up into the SEPIC level and put both of the front end and back end issues under the SEPIC to kind of contain them. Um, but in this one, it's just the URL and the profile name. And then there's uh, the implementation plan. And then you've got the front end and back end issues within this epic. Uh, so iteration one is just these two. I iteration two is adding just the, uh, the authentication, or I guess this would be iteration three, sorry. Iteration two would be the site validation. Iteration three is the um, authentication and request headers. Uh, so this also, this 
needs to be updated to include being able to switch between website and API. Uh, until we get the request headers, you it, it probably doesn't make too much sense to use the API. Some people may have unauthenticated APIs out there that they could scan. Um, so I guess there's some argument there that we can go back and forth and decide whether it makes sense to enable APIs before you get the request headers. But right now, it'll be uh, authentic authentication, API website selection, and request headers. By the way, update this one. Yep. request headers may be useful for a non-API site. I don't know how. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so I, that's funny. I, I was about to say that because um, one of the questions is like the way we display the uh, front end, we may want to uh, be very deliberate about how those fields get laid out, right? So one way is you just get a data dictionary and output all of them and say, fill in all these fields. And I think we want to be deliberate about the way that those fields are grouped, right? So log in, we, we have authentication. So we've got a login field, a password field, and then uh, the, the HTML input name for both of those. Those probably want to get clustered together. The request headers might want to be independent. And then, um, you know, we, we may just want to have very specific grouping of that uh, and not do that automatically on the front end or basically hard code the way that they get uh, outputted on the front end. Yeah, because there's different kinds of authentication. Like in future, you could have a script. Yep. Um, yep. There's also a field missing on this. I think submit form field potentially, but we can uh, go through these details in a bit more detail. Yeah. As we go. Okay. And the only other thing I think about this is that request headers and password could have sensitive information. Yes. Yeah, they, they very likely will. Um, so we need to deal with that in, I mean, I, I assume that since all of these are being set as a environment variable, right now we probably don't have much in terms of uh, handling uh, sensitive information. Uh, so we'll, we, that, we will need to keep that in mind, especially storing stuff like this in, in the database. Um, but there's obviously design patterns and, and uh, standards for storing sensitive inf information. So we'll just, you, you're right, we need to keep that in mind. Is there a specific, uh, when fields get, uh, for like passwords that are stored in the database, does anyone know if there's a specific way that those are stored? I was just yeah. wondering the same thing. So, so typically um, what, the way that I have done it in the past is to add some sort of salt to the, uh, to the password and then encrypt it. Uh, so that only the our website knows what that salt is. So uh, you can you would have the encrypted password plus whatever uh, some random thing that that was added to it. Uh, so so that only you know how to unencrypt that password. Yeah. So there's but there's there's multiple ways of going about it, and there's there's definitely. Uh, standards out there for your yeah. Passwords. I mean, I know we 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 have. Um, I think they're called masked values in the CI variable, so we can look at that code to see how that's handled. Yeah, we just need to work out what the GitLab way of doing it is. Right, exactly, and call that. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's a special naming convention or how it's handled. Yeah. Well, we should also talk to uh, uh, whichever group manages the users, the GitLab users, because we obviously store passwords in the database for each user. Yeah. Uh, so. That's and a bit yeah, different because they're one-way hashes. This is something that needs to be unencrypted as well. But you're right. That I mean, is true. Probably not yeah. More than me. yeah, so uh, when we get to that, uh, in that particular issue too, we can just uh, ping our AppSec team. Uh, so Dennis, uh, I think Dennis or uh, Nikhil um, are assigned to our team. So they can jump into those issues and uh, make sure yeah. we're doing things the proper way. Makes sense. All right. And then the last one is just adding the excluded URLs uh, field. So this is uh, kind of why I wanted to show two different ways of looking at this, because to me, um, this, even though it's kind of what we had talked about before, after looking at it and seeing it implemented, 
Uh, this feels overkill to me to have an epic for a single form field. I feel like it makes more sense to have an epic for the final deliverable, the final feature, and then have each of these in uh, issues. But that's what I want to get your feedback on. Uh, so let me go through the scanner profile before you give the feedback so you can see how that would work out because I've done that for the scanner profile in making these individual issues. And Derek, just so you know, if you click on that, um, that first one is 22767. Mm -hmm. I changed the name of it. See how it's iteration one, which I think is cached. I uh, added yeah. just a name um, because otherwise when we're looking at it, I don't know what iteration one or iteration two is. Sure. Um, so I just want to make sure that it's, it's descriptive. I wanted to get through them quickly. So. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Um, so yeah, we can change the names. I'm totally fine with that. Um, all right, so within this epic, which is the scanner profile epic, uh, you'll see there's the designs and then the uh, implementation order. Since this is really like a, a pretty simple form in general. There's no thing like the site validation that is interactive where you go through a different workflow. This is just adding in form fields. Um, what I did was create each of these as individual issues and then added in a design that shows you just the fields that would be implemented. Um, and then I assigned this first one to a milestone. Um, but then after that, I assigned it to just the next four to seven releases. So if this can be pulled into whatever milestone, we can review this each, each milestone, we can review these issues and decide what gets pulled into what milestone. Um, so we can pull in more than one. Um, the second iteration is adding the active passive selection. Uh, so that's added in there. Third one is the uh, Ajax Spider and the reports. So adding in the additional report formats and turning on and off the Ajax Spider. The next one, the uh, debug and add-ons. So you get the auto update add-ons and debug messages. And again, I would be super happy if all this could be implemented in a single milestone but I didn't want to force the entire profile to be delivered in one milestone. So you all will tell me, have to tell me what can be done in what order or what uh, um, milestones. Uh, this one is adding in the uh, rule exclusion, the CLI options and the alpha rule set. And the last one, uh, actually that was the last one. I just had a separate tab open. Okay, so yeah, that's the last one. So I guess, does that make sense to everybody, the way that this is laid out? Yeah. Cool. So that debug one, we'll need to work out what that means because we have Dast runs two processes. It runs the Dast Python and the Zap server. And we'll need to, at the moment, we have two different debug options. You can debug either. Um, okay. Maybe, maybe debug means debug the entire thing. Where, where was debug? Uh, oh, on that screen. Debug. Yep. Right here, show debug That's messages. It's just an on or off. But actually, right, so... So the configuration options DAS currently have is turn the DAS Python debug on or off, turn the Zap server debug on and off, and config configure the DAS, sorry, the Zap Python. So you might want to see all the HTTP messages as an example. But we can go into this detail later. I'm just throwing out information. So uh, yeah, I think that was based off DAS debug here. And yeah. DAS zap log configuration is really a debugging setting. Yeah, but, uh, uh, but yeah, it was set off of uh, DAS debug and it's Boolean, so it's true or false, which is why it was implemented in, in that form that way. Yeah, so this, this might be something that we uh, even just change, like DAS debug, we may want to couple that. So you set that to true, and it also turns on debug for zap, set to false. That's, yeah. that's what Dennis wants to. Yeah. 
I don't like it. I know he does. Right. Um, yeah. So sure. I, that, that is one thing that keep in mind is if um, we may be adding some additional uh, values to the DAS scanner, which then may mean that some of these screens get updated. Um, yeah. So, you know, we'll, we'll deal with that as that comes along. Yep. And, and we may find some things on the screen don't make sense uh, to expose. It may make sense uh, just in the scanner or just in the, C, uh, in the, the CI YAML file. Yeah. So some of this is fluid, uh, but we'll figure that out. Um, this is, like I said, all, all of these are taken directly from the uh, environment variables and uh, just trying to figure out which ones go and which ones apply to the site as a property and which ones apply to the scanner as a setting. All right. And then the last one is the library, which I've got an epic for here. Uh, this is broken down into three iterations. Uh, the first iteration is just creating and this one we can update the titles as well uh, to, to reference what they do. It's being able to see the sites, the site profiles, create the site profiles and delete the site profiles. So in the first iteration, the since it's planned for 13.2, the scan profiles will not be available yet. Um, so, you will only be able to do to deal with the uh, site profiles. We also don't want to be able to edit yet um, because we're trying to break it down uh, to where it's more deliverable. Uh, so it's just see, create, and delete. This is 13.2, but we've got like 15 days for that, right? Maybe more. But either way, this isn't going to be done in 13.2, right? Someone correct me if I'm wrong. We'd have to figure out who to assign this to, but uh, most likely not. Cool. It doesn't mean it won't start in 13.2. Yeah. Sure. So by the way, a lot of these, uh, I think most of these should have the refinement label put on them uh, because they do need to get scrubbed and make sure that everything is technically correct. Yep. Uh, okay. And then once the refinement uh, label, once it's been refined, uh, then we'll move to ready for development. Um, just one question for you, Derek. I can see mm -hmm. in that one that you've got open there, you, it says um, creating site profiles. Is there mm -hmm. a bit of overlap between one of the other sections and the other issue you had open? So this is, there. there is, and this is why they're all under the uh, UI configuration area. So the library will have a link to create the profile. But really when you get in there, the form that is that you're using to create the profile uh, is under a separate area. It's, it's under this profile here. Uh, I wanted the, the library to be listed separately because the functionality within the library pages, I wanna make sure that that's captured. And the creating the profile, technically you can get there from either the on-demand page or the configuration area. That makes sense. Thanks. Yep. All right, so that's the first iteration of that. Uh, the second iteration is being able to do the same thing with the scanner profiles and as well edit the profiles. Um, really, I feel like this, and this is kind of what, what uh, I talked about with Neil originally was to get the edit ability in the next iteration after the, uh, the profile library is delivered. Um, I could pull this out into its own, uh, basically its own issues um, because it's a separate piece of functionality than, than what, we what we would have for the scanner profiles and being able to view uh, create and delete. So if you all think that it should be in its own issue, I can create an issue for that. Uh, 
I mean, I'm a I'm a fan of smaller issues, but sure. their own. I'll pull that out into a separate issue then. Uh, and then the last one is logging the activity uh, that's done on the profile. So it's event logging. Um, Seth and I talked about, so originally we had talked about adding this into the activity tab here. Um, but Seth and I actually realized and something that I didn't realize that we had because I don't have maintainer or owner privileges on any of these repos or these projects um, is that there is a audit event uh, log that when you go to, when you're an owner or maintainer, you go to settings and audit events and you can see what happened uh, on that. So what we're gonna be doing is adding in the events for creating a new profile, deleting a profile or editing a profile into this audit events log. So you can see who did it, what they did, and when they did it. Uh, so this is something that we aren't doing right now. So this may take, I don't, I don't know if we'll need to um, coordinate with a separate team to get this in there or what, but uh, that's the, the scope of this uh, event logging. I would expect we should be able to, to do this. Um, it's just a matter of finding the right code to call. All right, we are over time, but that is all of these uh, issues that are in this area right now. Uh, and I think that the two uh, actions for me are to schedule a meeting to talk about the site validation and then uh, split the edit ability off into a separate issue. And Derek, I think before we have the meeting for site validation, once you get that issue uh, set, if you just send that into the dash channel, uh, I think we can put a number of our thoughts in there. Sure. And there is, a, uh, actually, it might be worth it to use the existing site validation design to discuss this. Uh, there's already a bit of discussion, but um, because our discussion may affect the design and how we do this, it might be worth it to have that discussion here rather than create a new issue for it. Yeah, I, I seem to recall this issue and I, I don't think it really covers validation of a REST APR. For example, there's no meta tags in a JSON document. But right, it I'll, does not. I can, it does I can not. look at it again. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, uh, Derek, after this, can you just throw this into the Slack channel so everyone's got this handy? Yep. Perfect. All right, so any other questions before we? Uh... That was really Good. useful, though. Thank you. Good. I'm glad that you found it useful. I, uh, I think that it, I mean, this is something we should have done probably a while ago. So uh, I apologize for that. Um, but uh, yeah, we've got it now. So yeah, so uh, definitely love to hear feedback uh, as we go through this about epics versus issues, front end, back end issues versus single issue. Um, so certainly any ideas on how to streamline this. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate you sitting and, and listening to me talk. <laughs> that was fun. Thanks, Jack. All right. Cheers. See ya. Thank you. See ya. See ya.